on the Zero Hour, I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. I haven't talked to my next guest for a while, and I've been looking forward to it for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you know, a lot of things have been happening in the news lately, uh, and it seems as if we never really cover our wars overseas. Uh, so I guess that's no surprise that we don't hear that much about them, although we should. Uh, but more importantly, in the last couple of weeks especially, it seems as if uh, the wars have come home, to use a phrase from 1960s radicalism. Uh, Danny Sherson, uh, and that, for those of you who are listening, S-J-U-R-S-E-N, Danny Sherson is a retired U.S. Army major. He, former instructor, uh, I believe history at West Point, uh, editor, uh, military strategist, uh, now uh, a writer and editor whose work appears in many places. Uh, and he is the author of the book, uh, the past book, Coast uh, um, Ghost Riders of Baghdad, uh, Soldiers, Civilians, and the Myth of the Surge. And he is uh, the author of the forthcoming book, Patriotic Descent, now available for pre-order. And he joins us now. So Danny Sherson, as always, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on. Yeah, it's always good to talk to you. And um, there were a couple things... I wanted to talk to you about in particular. One was, as I was watching here in D.C. and around the country, the behavior of National Guard troops. We, we could get into our overly militarized police forces, too, but as I was watching the behavior of National Guard troop, troops around this country, as I was watching the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, in uh, camouflage, uh, uh, a military... Uh, outfit, as it seemed to me, walking with the president for his photo op. Uh, time and time again, I've thought had a couple thoughts going on, which is, one, this doesn't feel very constitutional to me. And two, uh, maybe it's time to start talking about dissent within the, our uniformed ranks. And as always, when I went to check out your writing, uh, you were ahead of me on this one. So let's start with this. Um, you and, if I've, I've got this right, you and several other military vets uh, are calling for, uh, I don't know what to call it precisely, dissent uh, or something else on the part of uh, military troops involved in these uh, uh, policing of demonstrations. Is that right? That is, yeah. So, um, so I'm a member, uh, not a leader, but you know, I have been asked to speak about it. I'm a member of uh, both About Face Veterans Against the War, which used to be called Iraq Veterans Against the War, and uh, Veterans for Peace, as well as some other smaller groups. And what has been happening is that, in a really remarkable sort of way, the major national anti-war veteran organizations have have linked together. Uh, and About Face specifically has put out this uh, open letter. We call it, you know, uh, Stand Down for Black Lives. And it's encouragement, uh, understanding that the risks are those of the soldiers or the National Guardsmen, but encouragement and provision of support, legal, emotional, and otherwise logistics, to encourage these activated soldiers or activated guardsmen to, uh, you know, refuse their mobilization orders, uh, rebel in any sort of way and uh, sort of stand down in order to stand up for black lives. And we see this as, you know, more than just a, a constitutional duty, because, of course, we remember that the oath is not to the Donald or to any fleeting president or general, but rather to uh, defend against enemies, foreign and domestic, right, the Constitution in general. Uh, so we see this as a pivotal moment a waypoint we're all going to remember someday. And we're providing that encouragement and support for veterans to, or, or for active uh, military and guardsmen to stand down, to, to refuse their orders or, or dissent in any way. And, and, and I will tell you that there has been a really incredible, uh, more so than at any point in my lifetime, I would say probably more so than the late years of the Vietnam War, there has been a degree of GI resistance and dissent uh, and I'm not talking about the general mattices of the world solely or even primarily. I'm talking about rank and file dissent and refusal to police the streets of America 
And, uh, you know, we've had uh, hundreds of people uh, contact us in one form or the other. Uh, personally, I've had, you know, almost uh, probably about 85 uh, strangers who are on the active force asking me for advice, which, of course, I generally try not to give exactly, but offer support. And uh, just to be clear, you try not to give precise advice because I would assume because that involves moral and personal choices that are uh, up to everybody, every individual conscience. Is that why? Right. So, I mean, the advice I give is uh, I try to you know, I encourage, uh, I give my thoughts and analysis and I provide resources, right? I try to like sort of shift them in directions that they might need. But I guess what I'm saying is it's far be it for me to tell somebody to take the legal risk of refusing, you know, an order of a superior. So when I say I don't give, give advice, I mean, I don't give orders, you know, I don't tell people what to do. I think that would be inappropriate for any of us. And I try to have a degree of modesty and also recognize that my own resistance in the military, which was over about the last four years that I was in, was, you know, I had my troubles and in investigations, but it was more passive. You know, I didn't have, in many cases, some of the courage that we're asking folks to have. And, you know, part of that is because I was never faced with the uh, potentiality of uh, deploying in American streets. Uh, but part of it has got to be a recognition of humility that we're asking a profound thing of people or we're encouraging a profound thing. So I just I try to be modest about that. Uh, but I am having I am inundated. I will tell you, RJ, I am inundated with notes from active members, some of whom are my former students who are now lieutenants, but most of whom are strangers. Over the years, I've received these sorts of uh, notes before about how people are having ethical and professional crises about these wars. Uh, but I've received more in the last nine or 10 days than I have, you know, over the last three years. This is a remarkable moment. And, you know, it's got to be agonizing for the individuals involved, uh, for the soldiers involved. And uh, the reason why I say that, a couple reasons. One is, you know, in your upcoming book, which I'm reading now, you talk about uh, you talk about your own journey from, uh, uh, you know, from uh from a, someone who be believed in the mission to someone who saw how it was working out in your deployment in Iraq. Uh, I think back to when I was first politically active in high school, when Vietnam was still going on and, you know, the, the, the consequences that active duty military faced for standing up and speaking then, and you might hear so-and-so is AWOL now or whatever, so-and-so is in prison. So you're really talking about Two things, I think, but I, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, Danny. One is, I think probably most, uh, many or most of the individuals like this that you're hearing from uh, join the military with some sense of mission and idealism. So they've had to contend with the loss of that. And then at the same time, they're agonizing over uh, potentially uh, uh, being faced with being given orders that are unconscionable and potentially unconstitutional. And then thirdly, I guess, uh, you know, for the consequences could be extremely grave for them individually. So you've got to be talking about individuals in, in crisis, right? This is going to be a pivotal moment in their lives, uh, sort of whatever decision they take. Uh, these are wild times. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this in quite some time. So yes, the risks are extreme. Uh, especially with a, you know, Donald Trump run military and justice department. Uh, I would not suspect that the folks who have already refused and the ones that will continue to refuse are going to be dealt with very kindly. Uh, that would have been true in really any administration, but I think it is probably even uniquely bad. Now, um, there, there is a sense of ethical and professional crisis out there in the ranks that, that I don't think any of us have seen in quite some time. Uh, some, something to sort of keep in mind about this is the volunteer military, which technically we have, even though in many cases it's kind of like a legacy military family thing and then it's largely an economic draft. But the volunteer force, the getting rid of the draft, was a Nixonian initiative. Mm -hmm. And we now have seen the, uncla the, you know, the, re the declassified documents showing that, look, Nick, this was a cynical decision by Nixon, like right. all Nixon decisions. The goal was – to tamp down on public dissent from, you know, college and high school kids who knew they might get drafted and thus were against the war, and also to tamp down on GI dissent. And let me just say really quickly on the history of that, whitewashed from uh, the American, you know, histories that are mostly written and spoken about – 
is the fact that it wasn't the only factor, but a major factor in the anti-war movement that had some real effects was GI resistance, especially from about 1969 to 72, when you had things like uh, cafes and coffee shops that were sort of like salons of anti-war, thinking outside these bases, GI underground newspapers, folks refuse entire platoons refusing to patrol up to and including fragging officers which means like rolling a grenade into the tent of an officer who is particularly aggressive and wanted to go out and like you know win medals i mean there were the army didn't even start counting these until 1970 which is instructive uh, but just from 1970 until july of 1972 there were 551 incidents where there was attempted murder fragging of officers and non-commissioned officers and they resulted in 86 deaths so the, the point is, the powers that be, and this is sort of what I recently wrote about in my anti-war column, Chicken Hawk America, is the thing that the security state and the status quo defenders fear the most is GI dissent, because they are few and we are many, except they've always been able to count on the foot soldiers, which ranges from security guards to Delta Force. But the minute they start to lose them, they're just few. And it's a terrifying thing, and it's got them shaking in their boots to some extent, I believe. You know, uh, maybe parenthetically, Danny, but uh, uh, and again, we're talking with Danny Schertzen, retired U.S. Army major and uh, writer and contributing editor at antimore.com. Uh, we had uh, um, Douglas Rush Rushkoff on, the author, who was wrote about uh, being asked to speak to a group of hedge funders on... Uh, who wanted to figure out how to survive if the apocalypse, if civilization collapsed. And they were saying things like, could we put electric collars on our guards so they would be shocked if they disobeyed an order? Or could we deprive, lock up the food so they couldn't get it if they dis... I, mean, I feel like we're in one of those moments where as, as our efforts, uh, uh, our government's efforts to use social control... Uh, through police and military, reach levels that in a way we haven't seen since the 1960s uh, or maybe early 70s, uh, we're going to see uh, an escalation of intimidation against just the very individuals you're talking about. So I think your description of it as a, uh, as a pivotal moment is, is very true. And by the way, I remember, you know, those cafes and those things uh, for dissenting soldiers. So is one of your missions, uh, if I may call it that, uh, working with um, About Face uh, and the other groups, is, is one of the missions to create social and other spaces where dissenting soldiers can share information, talk to one another, get support, that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think in the mid and long term, you know, to some, you know, we've been working this stuff for a while, but George Floyd and the protests and, and, and COVID and all the things that created the kindling for this explosion, I don't think a lot of us necessarily predicted. But in the mid and long term, you know, political and just general intellectual education about the empire, about alternatives to military service, about the military industrial complex uh, for not just veterans, but active troops is a vital part, I think, of what we're trying to do. It's, it's why we do speaking engagements. It's why we, so many of us, write and publish and, uh, and are encouraged, you know, to talk to our own sources within the military because many of us have peers and former subordinates and just connections out there. I think it is vital. Uh, look, I am not of the opinion that my or anyone else's veteran status or combat status automatically provides, you know, wisdom. I think that we actually have to sort of give up on the fetishization, right, of military mm -hmm. folks in general. However, taking the world as it is, what we know is the American people trust uh, and, and sort of give credibility to soldiers and veterans at a higher right rate than any other public servant, any other public institution. So what does that mean? Well, I think that it's a, a responsibility rather than a privilege, meaning that it, uh, it sort of mandates us to try to speak out and get our voice there, if only because it has a better chance of potentially making a difference. Now, whether that's a positive or a negative thing for a supposed small R republic to so fetishize its military is a whole other question. But in this moment, practically, yes, we think that uh, education, 
resources, support, and just pointing people in directions of free or at least dissenting or alternative thinking has value because there is a profound anti-intellectualism that still sort of infuses the military system. And, and it's by design. So, uh, Danny Sherson, I want to get your thoughts on one aspect of this that I've been thinking about a lot. And I just wrote a piece last month, uh, last week, rather, about it. And that's, uh, I grew up, as you did, uh, in a kind of white working class environment. And uh, although my dad, you know, got promoted by the time I was in my teens, but I grew up in this, you know, environment where, uh, you know, Mickey Spillane's detective novels where Mike Hammer always shoots the guy or beats him up or woman, by the way, who, who, uh, who betrays his values or, you know, a million other ways that it was just kind of a male culture of, you know, fists talk first, guns talk first, you know, conversation comes later, if at all. And I'm just wondering to you know, what they would call now toxic masculinity, I guess. And I'm wondering to what extent part of the struggle we have to face as we uh, we push back against some of the cases we've seen of excessive police violence, excessive natural guard violence, isn't kind of a struggle to push back on that culture we grew up in. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And does it resonate with you at all? A hundred percent. You know, I was raised in very patriarchal and paramilitary, frankly, Staten Island. You know, I, I was raised on the East Shore, sort of the borderlines between the more urban and uh, minority uh, filled north of the island and then the completely white, uh, completely just like loaded with cops south shore. So I was kind of on that cusp. And uh, my own family uh, has, you know, we have firemen several generations. Some of them were cops before they were firemen. Uh, there is a an a absolute adulation of all things military and paramilitary. And the blue wall that you always hear of, this like closing of ranks within the police, uh, was a, just a reality. And it was cops versus criminals. And it was very black and white, which was, of course, odd because in, for example, my neighborhood uh, and in my own family and those of all the families close to us, about half the boys uh, didn't become cops or firemen, but rather turned to drugs or low-level crimes. So it was interesting that we so delineated the boundaries between sort of cowboys and Indians, good guys and bad guys, but we did. Um, that culture uh, has infused not just the military, but the police. And, and it's always been there, but it's only gotten worse, especially as we've started sharing equipment, training, and tactics. So what worries me about police militarization, for example, it, the cosmetic stuff like the body armor and the riot gear and the MRAP, you know, armored vehicles, very worrisome, has to be stopped. But the militarized mandate and the militarized culture of policing that these folks were raised in is really at issue. And so on an anecdotal level, you know, I, I was out in Kansas City, uh, you know, eight or so of the last of uh, the first 11 nights that it sort of kicked off here. And I mean, I could pick out the individual police officers who were behaving badly, who were mm -hmm. constantly aggressive, constantly escalatory. Some were black, some were white. But what was interesting about them is I felt like I was looking at my old soldiers again. You know, uh, there's in any, anyone who's ever been in that sort of like loyal paramilitary organization knows that there's always a few folks in your squad that are like lunatics that like the job too much. And, yeah. and what part of the problem of these organizations is the folks you want on the street as soldiers, as police are often the ones that, that don't have that feeling. And, and so there's a paradox and it's very difficult. And I think that coming from where I came from and seeing what I've seen in the military, none of this is particularly surprising, but it's all disturbing and has to change. See, one of the things, Danny Sherson, that I've been puzzling about in that piece that I wrote, but just in general, is, you know, the mechanism by which I felt and I wrote in that police uh, that piece, and maybe it was unfair that you know that something in our elite, in our system of governance or whatever, our elites or our social structure, something wants the guys who are mean and the guys who are out of control, and frankly, the guys who aren't too smart. It just you know, 
uh, the hair trigger personalities. I mean, there, there's got to be a reason why Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, you know, had multiple complaints of excessive force, and yet he was still there. There's got to be a reason why this culture persists, and maybe part of it is the Department of Defense giving away uh, to the police departments all of this valuable uh, military equipment, excessive equipment, I would say, and then saying, if you don't use it within a year, we'll take it back. Sure, that kind of thing has got a lot to do with it, but there's something there that says at the deepest levels, we may have, you know, the, the, the police chief who can say the right things in front of the camera or whatever, but uh, there's something in our culture that still wants that in our armed forces and still wants it in our police forces, it seems to me, and won't let go of it, even as we try to educate them. I, what do you think about that? I think that part of it is that the folks who have that aggressive attitude are, first of all, attracted to military and police service. Some of that is just the way they were raised, uh, films they've watched, and sort of other cultural touchstones. Then they get into the military or they get into the police, and the culture's already there, and it's it's kind of archaic, right? It's, 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 a, it's a different world. I mean, for example, having been in the military, in some ways it's a time warp, or at least it was, although that's changing. I mean, it, we used to joke that, like, if you want to go back to, like, you know, a faux version of, like, 1950s nuclear family conservatism, like, move on to Fort Bragg, right? But if you go into Fayetteville, North Carolina, it's the real world. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's always been that, and it gets reinforced within sort of those institutions. I, I do think that it's it's wildly problematic. It's difficult to break because many, I would say at least half of Americans, and they're more generally the more conservative ones, but not only – have a feeling about their soldiers and to some extent, as disturbing as it is about their police, there's this idea of like uh, those fire uh, escape things, you know, where there's like the axe in there and it says break only in case of emergency. There's a sense that our soldiers and our police should be those kind of folks. You know, they're not necessarily polite at a cocktail party, but, you know, if you really have to fight the Russians, then break glass in case of emergency. But those people whether they're National Guardsmen, active soldiers, or police, are not the ones we want as beat cops doing community policing, which all the scholarship, or the vast majority of it shows, is what works. That's why, finally, I think the intersectionality of our anti-war veteran movement and a lot of other movements is important, because some people decry identity politics, and taken to its extreme, it can be problematic when it you know, eliminates class, for example. But if we're not fighting the patriarchy, if we're not fighting on these other issues, race, anti-war, then we're not going to change the culture and it's all going to be for nothing anyway because you have to affect people because people are making these decisions, whether to spray pepper spray in an innocent diminutive woman's eyes four feet from me or not, a person made that decision and the culture informs them. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. And we've been talking about uh, uh, Danny Scherz and we've been talking about uh, within the military and to a certain extent within the police force as well, as well as the general culture. But there's a kind of middle layer. And the middle layer uh, in all this uh, are the people, uh, chicken hawks is a term that's been around many, many years. But uh, chicken hawk America, I would say personally, the chicken hawk in chief is Donald Trump, uh, you know, who never, as far as I know, risks his life in uh, in any uh, situation other than perhaps uh, excessive consumption of carbohydrates, maybe. But, you know, I don't think this is a guy, This, but this is a perfect example to me of uh, the kind of individual who fetishizes military, fetishizes tough guys, has never... I, I, look, I don't want to fetishize tough guys. You, I think you'll relate to this. I want to state the problem without fetishizing toughness. So I'm in a paradox here, because when I talk about someone like Donald Trump, I want to say this is a guy who is probably never in a fist fight, as if like my being in a fist fight makes me a better guy, which is exactly what I'm arguing against. But now I'm arguing a, a, a double situation where someone who thinks that's great has never done it. And I, that's my definition of a chicken hawk. I don't know if it relates with yours, and I don't know yeah. if you relate to the struggle I had just expressing that. 
I have, I have an enormous struggle. I mean, uh, <laughs> instructively, I think, you know, I, I made a joke on uh, Twitter the other night about how, you know, a less peaceful version of myself would have wanted to fight Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, on live TV, you know. And I said something like, uh, you know, uh, now I know how clowns feel after John Wayne Gacy's story broke, you know, because we're both Army veterans. Uh, you know, I'm torn between that, too, because uh, I am I am apt and I regularly call out these chicken hawks. And yet I also don't think that just because you are a tough guy in any real sense that that gives you more credibility. But I do think we have to know that there is something obscene about the figure of Donald Trump and many others like him who are it, it, it is really completely apparent now that, for example, Trump is his life is informed by his wild insecurities, right, about masculinity and about a million things. Uh, that actually has caused, it seems, his reflexive tough guy status and escalation that we've seen as like he's just an accelerant for violence right now. Um, you know, when his war came up of his generation, he was perfectly aged for it. Vietnam, well, he never got near it and he never even really considered it except to compare it to avoiding STDs on the Howard Stone, Stern show. And then he always talks about how he always wanted to earn a purple heart. I mean, it, he's so absurd about it, but we should pay attention when he speaks because he's not kidding in any real sense. This is what informs him and so many people atop our government. We are reaching a point where the chicken hawks are running the show because for the first time since the end of the Vietnam War, polls, many polls, some from conservative institutions like the Kochs, show that seven out of ten – veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan don't think those wars are worth fighting, for example. And yet on they continue, right. largely shepherded by these never having served, never seen a shot fired in anger, even if they were in the military like Pompeo, but, you know, never saw combat and, you know, never put themselves on the line. And th th there really is something obscene about that. We must call it out while also, like you said, tempering it with the idea that we don't want like all the tough guys to be fetishized. Yeah. And it's a, it, it, so again, I mean, no, look, I think one of the things I've learned is, uh, you know, even though my dad was a teacher and, uh, you know, educator, and so was my mom, you know, even for me, just growing up in that world that I grew up in, it, for me, it's going to be a lifelong struggle just to get it, try to get it, if not right, then a little bit better. That's the internal struggle. Then there's the social struggle. And then there's a political struggle. So maybe before we go, Danny Sherson, we can talk a little bit about this because uh, we not only have the domestic problem of, uh, uh, of uh, the misuse of military and law enforcement, but lest we forget, as I said in my introduction, uh, we are still, and as you just mentioned, we are still waging war in Iraq and Afghanistan. ISIS attacks, I just saw... Uh, reportedly surging again in uh, in Iraq. Uh, so we've got, you wrote this piece, you know, the end of war as we know it. Uh, you know, where are we going to go in the future and how do, what do we do to, um, I'll make the question a little as broad, uh, what's the future you think of anti-war political organizing? It seems to me this is one place where uh, left and right, uh, at least those of us on the left who are anti-war, because uh, not everyone is, um, might get together and form a coalition uh, to try to do something about this. You think that's uh, possible? Absolutely. I'm I'm uh, hopeful, if not fully optimistic. Uh, the rumblings that are happening right now are real, and it's important to note. Uh, again, I can speak. Personally, but I read it that it's more broad. I'm getting more, you know, I'm getting encouraging thoughts about dissent and being against these wars from active folks who run the gamut from usually libertarian to progressive left. So there is a nascent alliance that's that's always been there, sort of waiting to happen, and it's it's beginning to come together. But let's not underestimate the empire. Let's not underestimate the military industrial complex. And that's what my piece was about. Uh, what I said essentially is, you know, for empires, wars don't so much end, they evolve. These are savvy folks who make up savvy structures and systems that make sure that wars, which are professionally and pecuniary 
benefits to them and to their organizations continue. So what I think we'll see in a you know post-pandemic warfare, as I call it, I call it the social distancing version of warfare, is a continued evolution that's already begun towards uh, less of our combat conventional troops on the ground, thereby less American casualties. Uh, hopefully, um, we may even get to zero, which uh, would be interesting if we're still killing tens and hundreds of thousands of folks, but no Americans die. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to make war as abstract as ever in American or in world history, because we're going to rely on what I call uh, machines, mercenaries, and militias. So drones would epitomize the machines. Uh, mercenaries would be epitomized by folks like Eric Prince and the Silver Corps lunatics who tried the coup in Venezuela. And then the militias is the proxy forces, whether they be corrupt human rights violators in the security forces we raise and train and pay for, or literal warlord militias across West Africa and all the way to Afghanistan. So we work through these proxies. We bring American casualties almost to zero, but it still feels, I guarantee you, like a real war to the Yemeni child under the bomb. And so no that's kidding. what I wrote about on Memorial Day, too, is that there's something obscene about memorializing our dead when the scale of disparity is, is, is so wild. And I'll finish with this, saying that empire, like all empires do, has come home. Because when I went to peacefully protest in Kansas City, I was not necessarily expecting it. I should have been. I was not necessarily expecting it to look like Kandahar. And the folks in Baltimore, they saw Baghdad. And many of us who are veterans of those wars are having like serious like PTSD symptoms brought back up in a flashback, metaphorical largely, but sometimes real sense by the war coming home to our streets up to and including, you know, being tear gassed by my own government. And I'm not alone in that. So it's a it's a it's a crazy thing. And the empire has come home. It's always been there, but now it's been exposed. And some people say that's the end stage of the empire's life cycle to actually turn on your own populations in that way. Uh, well, there's a lot to think about and there's a lot to keep tracking, you know, and I was thinking as you were talking that this virtual war or socially distanced war, it's a logical next step from eliminating the draft, which protected it, protected uh, uh, upper middle class and, and, and uh, you know, folks from from uh, uh, fear of war. I was subject to the draft myself, but I had a high draft number. So I pulled on TV um, to uh, the logical next step is, well, let's have no Americans, but we'll still pay the what, if you will, uh, social and karmic and other penalties of, of being an empire. And uh, that's my closing word. I'll give you a closing thought if you want it. Absolutely. Just, you know, to finish up both the empire coming home and the abstraction that war is becoming is, as you mentioned, the logical and absurd conclusion of turning our military machine into a Praetorian guard or a foreign legion mercenary element of sorts. This is where it ends. This is a historical process and we're living it now. I don't pretend to know how it turns out, but uh, there are reasons to be hopeful that the foot soldiers are refusing or thinking about it in ways they have not in really 50 years. Well said, and we'll have to leave it there. But uh, Daniel Scherzen, Danny Scherzen, retired U.S. Army major, writer, and author of the upcoming book, uh, Patriotic Descent. Um, as always, thanks for your thoughts. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, and we'll talk again soon. Look forward to it. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.